In general, we look for new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we come... Well, don't laugh. That's the really true. A lot of people believe that science is a method of telling the truth. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. But it's not. That's a fundamental category error. Is math related to science? Science is just a method. It is not a truth-telling device. And a new study suggests hugging your dog is bad for your dog. Science is intrinsically and fundamentally dependent upon the honesty and the integrity of the scientist. And right now, whether you realize it or not, science is in a major crisis. And the reason is that scientists have ceased to make use of their own famous scientific method. It's what's called the reproducibility crisis. So you just have all of these exploratory studies out there that are taken as fact, that this is a scientific fact that's never actually been confirmed. People who are actually going back and taking the trouble to try to reproduce the results that scientists are reporting as quote-unquote scientific fact are not able to reproduce it. In fact, the majority of the time, the results that are claimed in these peer-reviewed, professionally published papers in reputable journals are false they cannot reproduce more than 50% of the published science that is tested. And this is the good stuff. And it gets worse. Nature did a poll in 2016. They surveyed 1,500 scientists. They found out that 70% of them were unable to reproduce experiments that other scientists had published. But even worse, 50% of them couldn't reproduce successfully their own experiments. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. So the idea that you're going to be able to rely upon a method that most of the time is inaccurate and false is ludicrous. When you're dealing with a secular scientist who has tremendous incentive to falsify results, or to simply put a little thumb on the scale, or to make sure that he finds the results that the people funding him want to find, you have a problem. And science will come up with some reason to put in the books, but in the end, it'll be just a theory. I mean, we will fail to acknowledge that there are forces at work beyond our understanding. No, I'm not saying that uh, a scientist is necessarily going to, you know, is any more likely to lie or cheat or falsify data than anyone else. But here's the thing, when you do not have a religious incentive to tell the truth, and you have a tremendous financial incentive to not tell the truth, can we really be surprised when these professional scientists find a way to fudge things just a little bit to make sure the results come out the way that gets them published, that gets them paid? So that's why we're seeing this crisis in science is because we are seeing fewer Christians in science. Now Christians lie. Christians sin. I have sinned against you, my Lord. This is all true. But you cannot claim, logically or with a straight face, that it is unlikely for there to be a connection to removing this religious incentive to tell the truth, replacing it with a financial incentive to not tell the truth, and then discover magically <laughs> that these scientists are not telling the truth. So now, this is not a conclusive case. I admit that. But I am simply pointing out that there is reason to believe that contra the assumptions of those who believe that science and religion, that science and Christianity are at war, I submit that science needs Christianity or at least something that serves as an adequate substitute in order to avert what we're seeing as the reproducibility crisis. The post-Christianity of the scientific community is one of the biggest dangers to science that exists today. Family life, for culture, and for art. While these things don't necessarily strike a lot of people as being fundamentally important, the truth is that they are because they are the soul of a society and of a civilization. When archaeologists study ancient cultures and talk about what they were like, those are the areas, the architecture, the art, the items of daily life, those are areas that are used to define the society in historical terms. Yeah. Get up, man. Get up. When you look at the changes that we have witnessed in the West 
and in the United States and in Europe in particular. The decline of Christianity as a cultural and societal influence has had a tremendous effect on not just the shape of those societies, but also in their fitness to survive in a world where there are multiple competing civilizations and societies. So let's look at the concept of the family first. Yeah, after all, families have existed as long as there have been humans without some semblance of reproduction and family life humanity would not even exist today so we can't say that the existence of the family in the broader sense is dependent in any way on christianity and yet if you look at the form that families have taken in historical cultures and in modern non-Christian cultures, what you see is that there's a, a fundamental difference between the Christian concept of the nuclear family and the extended family and the clan structures that tend to dominate in non-Christian societies. Um, why, why do I... And one of the most important aspects of that was the direct result of the Catholic Church's ban on cousin marriages. In fact, in Francis Fukuyama's two books on the Western political order, he actually credits this ban on cousin marriage for a surprising amount of the West's accomplishments. Because the ban on cousin marriage has had a tremendous effect on everything from crime rates to monogamy versus polygamy, even to average intelligence levels. You know, one of the big problems in countries like the UK, where there has been a lot of immigration from countries like Pakistan, where cousin marriage is not only permitted, but is actually preferred, they're suddenly seeing a broad range of birth defects, and they're also seeing a much larger percentage of low IQ births and subsequently low IQ adults than would normally be expected. And that's because of some of the genetic problems that tends to come along with cousin marriage. And if you look at historical societies, cousin marriage and even brother-sister marriage is actually surprisingly common. I was reading The Tale of Genji, uh, a book from 7th century Hei in Japan, and practically everyone is related. The Tale of Genji is, is essentially a long romance novel about the Heian court. Many of the various affairs that are taking place are actually taking place between cousins, between uncles and nieces, even occasionally between aunts and nephews. This is a pattern that we see over and over again. You know, we see it in the old Egyptian royal family, all kinds of Eastern cultures. So, you guys, seriously, this next thing I feel is very special. That's how you want to get now it's easy to say, well, that's fine and all from a historical perspective, but you know, I'm an atheist and I'm not about to you know, run out and, and propose to my cousin. You know, we, we know better now. Science has taught us otherwise. And there's an element of truth in that, but the problem is people don't respond as well to scientific reasons as they do moral and social pressures. You know, for every argument that you come up with, I'm not going to marry my cousin, you can all also point to a science-based solution. Well, what does it matter if you're involved with your cousin? What does it matter if you're involved with your brother as long as you're using some form of birth control? For every science-based reason to avoid doing something, there is a science-based solution permitting you to go ahead and do that. This leads us into the next problem Western civilization faces without Christianity, which is, of course, the problem of non-objective morality. And they're finding human sexuality is on a spectrum. Voltaire very famously once said he would rather that his servant was a believer, that his servant was a Christian, than not be, even though he wasn't a believer himself. But secular thinkers have been arguing that it is possible to have Western civilized moral behavior from people who are not Christians uh, who do not subscribe to the basis for that morality. Now that was all fine in theory, and they could make that case because they were living in a society that was completely inundated by Christian morals. But that's no longer the case. What we're seeing has completely falsified that idea. What we're able to observe from people's behavior in a secular post-Christian society is that no, in fact, most people are not able and are not willing and are not interested in subscribing to a Christian morality that solves Christianity. 
we're seeing a lot of the very curses that were promised in the Bible to a society that lost its faith in God. And there's even a verse that talks about the society that loses its faith is cursed to have children and women rule over them. And that's kind of a eerily precise prediction if you look at the current state of the Western governments, countries that are ruled over by feckless leaders like Theresa May, like Angela Merkel. So if you look at the moral degradation, if you look at the growing number of societal ills that afflict many, if not most, of the countries across the West, we see that post-Christianity and secularism does not appear to be compatible with maintaining the Christian moral basis for society. While we're talking about degradation, <laughs> this leads us very naturally to the arts. And one of the most striking things when you're traveling through Europe is you see these beautiful cathedrals. And then not far away, you'll see some horrendous modern block structure. The contrast between the two simply cannot be exaggerated. If you look at the comparison of the splattered paint, or worse, the splattered menstrual blood of one of these modern artists, and then you compare it to the painters of the past, you compare it to a Caravaggio, you compare it to any of the great Renaissance or Enlightenment painters, it's enough to cause you to become depressed. And in the case of music, it may be even worse. When you compare the intricate melodies of a Mozart or even a Vivaldi to the grunting and thumping of modern rap, and the, the auto-tuned singers who can't even sing in tune without the help of technological assistance. The, light and let it shine. the comparison is simply grotesque and does not favor the modern age in any way, shape, or form. And that's not an accident. Christianity repeatedly points to the good, to the beautiful, and the true. When you no longer have the belief to pursue that, when you are no longer seeking to praise God through your creative works, what does that leave? We see what it leaves. And what it leaves is ugliness, depravity, the utter degradation of the soul. This is a process that multiplies itself. It snowballs. It gains force because as the younger generations grow up, they don't know any better. They have no ability to appreciate beautiful art because they're used to looking at ugliness. They have no taste for beauty because they have been taught to see beauty in ugliness. They've been taught to love evil. Possibly the most important aspect of Christianity, the thing that Western civilization requires most from Christianity, is the combination of hope and longer time preferences that Christianity necessarily entails. Because if you're a Christian, then you intrinsically accept that this is not all there is. That there is something beyond the present moment that matters to you. And that ability to look beyond the present moment is possibly the most important aspect of Christianity with regards to Western civilization. Western civilization fundamentally depends upon men planting the acorns, planting the seeds for the trees under whose shade they will never sit. When you look at the cultural heritage of the West, it was provided to us by men who were not thinking of themselves, who were not thinking of their generation, but they were thinking of the future. They were thinking of a future that they were not going to see in their material lives. And yet they valued it because, as Christians, they were accustomed to the idea of working for something beyond themselves. And that is entirely antithetical to the modern idea of this is all you got, this is the only time you have, make the most of it now while you've got it. What we see when we look at the current state of the post-Christian West, we see that the one thing that it lacks more than anything else is hope for the future. That's why people don't have children. That's why people lose themselves to drug abuse and other forms of addictions. The key to civilization, more than anything else, is longer time preferences. There is no better way of instilling longer time preferences than a belief in eternity and a belief that your actions today will be judged at some point in the future. For all of these reasons, family, culture, art, time preferences, Christianity is fundamentally vital to Western civilization. I'm not saying that modern Christianity does not have serious problems. It has been attacked unmercifully from within and without. I think that you can make a very good case that Christian leaders from the man they call Pope Francis to the Russell Moore, the current head 
of the Southern Baptist Convention. I think you can make a serious case that those men are not truly Christians and that they do not genuinely believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are real problems in the Christian church. There are real problems with both fake Christians as well as real Christians who are too weak in their faith to stand up for what is true, what is right, what is beautiful, and what is good. But don't make the mistake of judging Christianity by the flawed or the fake Christian. And don't make the mistake of assuming that simply because of centuries of Christian societal inertia that the things that you value about historical Christian society are going to survive in a post-Christian world.